The Kingdom of Spain had very disappointing collapse of their empire. Everything you see in red used to be controlled by Spain, making them one of the biggest empires in human history. Although they are often forgotten, as the British, Roman and Mongol empires are more popular. After Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain, it all started going downhill. After the Peninsular War, Spain was in a political crisis, accompanied by the loss of most of its overseas colonies in the Americas and the rise of Basque and Catalan nationalism during the Industrial Revolution. In modern history, Spain suffered from a civil war in the late 1930s, with their colonial empire not being as impressive as it was the decades before. But what if all that changed and Spain managed to remain a global power, keeping hold to the Americas and much of the new world? Let's see how this could have happened and what would change. I already mentioned that after Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain, the colonies started their transition to independence. Looking at the independence date of each Spanish-speaking South American nation, you will see it's mostly in the early 1820s. In fact, during almost the entire 19th century, Spain was affected by civil wars, revolutions and coup d'etat, which permanently hampered economic and social development in the Iberian Peninsula. The last major blow to the backward kingdom was the war with the United States in 1898, which ended in a total defeat for the Spanish, due to which the last colonies in the Americas were lost, while also ending their supremacy of the Philippine Islands, which became a protectorate of the United States of America. But how could the Spaniards avoid this inevitable fate, and at the same time remain in a position of a colonial and military power, albeit a second one? To find the answer, we have to go right back to the beginning, to the time after the Congress of Vienna, when King Ferdinand VII returns to Spain from exile. The first fatal mistake that started the disintegration of the Kingdom of Spain was the refusal of King Ferdinand VII to swear to the Constitution of 1812 and the subsequent restoration of the absolute monarchy, against which the inhabitants of the Iberian Peninsula did not initially rebel, but in the overseas colonies it started to discontent and calls for independence. The Vice Royalty of New Spain, the Vice Royalty of New Granada and the Vice Royalty of Peru were willing to remain under Spanish supervision, but only on the condition that Spain remains a constitutional monarchy under which all overseas colonies in the Americans would have the required degree of autonomy. You can think of this like Britain and their dominions in Canada, Australia and India. This did not happen in our history, so from Mexico to Chile all Latin American countries began to rebel against the Spanish crown, followed by their wars of independence, which the Spanish king tried to suppress, but unfortunately for him he antagonized the people, which subsequently led to a civil war in the Kingdom of Spain in 1820-1823, ending with the loss of all overseas colonies in the Americas except Cuba and Puerto Rico. In this alternate history, however, Ferdinand VII controls himself and decides to honor the Spanish constitution of 1812, thus avoiding the already mentioned chain of events. While this is not guaranteed to secure all the colonies, most would remain loyal to Spain. I can see the Philippines, Argentina and Chile trying to get their independence, but they can never achieve it. The Philippines were historically controlled by Spain up until 1898, so this would continue this time. In fact, as reading from comments left by you guys on the video I made on this topic, People say that the Philippines would want to remain under the Spanish crown but wanted autonomy, something that wasn't given to them, leading to their rebellions. This leads me to think that had Spain become a constitutional monarchy and given autonomy to their subjects, they could have avoided their collapse. Thanks to this, there would be no rebellions in either America or the Iberian Peninsula. Unfortunately, with a half-empty treasury, the king is still forced to sell Florida to the United States of America, in order to restart Spain's crisis-ridden economy. Just so you know how things continued with the defeated kingdom in our history, after the loss of their overseas colonies, the king was put under house arrest, after which the liberals seized power trying to democratize the country. However, this provoked neighboring France and Britain who agreed it was necessary to intervene in order to maintain stability in Western Europe and crush Spanish Republicans who cooperated with the liberals. As a result, French troops crossed the Pyrenees Mountains and after defeating the Spanish army, installed King Ferdinand VII as an absolute ruler. However, he never used his absolute power wisely, and although he prevented the newly independent Mexico from conquering Cuba, during the subsequent attempt to reconquer Mexico in 1829, his army was defeated, another nail in the coffin. In this alternate history, nothing like that would happen, as the constitutional monarchy is run by a coalition of conservatives and liberals, plus Mexico as the vice royalty of New Spain will remain part of the Commonwealth. Thus, during the 1820s, Spain could stabilize itself economically and cautiously open the door to industrialization and modernization. But now another event is coming, which meant a greater complication for the monarchy. 
In the early 1830s, Ferdinand VII issues the pragmatic sanction, thanks to which his daughter can also inherit the throne, since he had no male descendants. The reform wasn't popular, but it had to be done to secure the territorial integrity of Spain, but this did not please the conservative wing of the royalists, who wanted the king's brother Don Carlos to take the throne. This is why this wing will be called Carlist in the future. On the other side of the barricade stood the loyalists, who remained loyal to Ferdinand VII, his wife and his daughter Isabella. After Ferdinand VII's death in 1833 and the subsequent regency led by his wife, Maria Cristina of the Two Sicilies, who became Queen Regent, there broke out the First Carlist War, which lasted until 1840. To avoid this scenario, the King of Spain decides to entrust his younger brother, Don Carlos, to become the next king, which would happen in 1833. The newly crowned King Don Carlos will be known as Carlos V, who will rule until his death in 1855. This move would avoid yet another civil war in Spain. Although Carlos V was a staunch traditionalist, it is likely that by retaining the American dominions, Spain will be able to industrialize and modernize quickly under his rule. Moreover, without the Carlist Wars, revolutions and coup d'etat, the Pyrenean colonial power will be able to remain a power, albeit a secondary one. It is possible that if the monarchy maintains a strong military with modern weapons and military doctrines, it would be able to resist the United States' efforts to control the southwestern provinces that have been long part of Mexico. Perhaps the most important question would remain how the Kingdom of Spain would react to the American Civil War, and if so, which side would they support? After the death of Carlos V, his son Carlos Luis de Bourbon would most likely take the throne, who this time did not have to die at the age of 42, as the doctors would have taken good care of him as the new king, now known as Carlos VI. Under his rule, the country would remain a strongly conservative Catholic country that would try to successfully keep all of its overseas colonies, whether in America or Asia. The American Civil War in the first half of the 1860s would present a chance for the Spanish Empire to regain Florida had King Carlos VI helped Abraham Lincoln defeat the Confederacy. Let's say that it will happen, and thanks to the Spanish intervention, the war between the North and the South was only a year. And then Abraham Lincoln would not have been shot, because he would have managed to consolidate and stabilize the United States economically in the time. Subsequently, the situation in North America would develop as follows. California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Southwestern Texas, Plus, the newly acquired Florida would remain under the administration of the Viceroy of New Spain, in agreement with the American Republican government. Throughout the second half of the 1800s, the United States and the Spanish Empire would work closely together to weaken the influence of the United Kingdom and Tsarist Russia, which even in this alternate history would sell Alaska to the United States in the second half of the 1860s. Since Abraham Lincoln was not shot, it is more than likely that he would rule for a long time, probably until 1873, when he would not participate in another election due to his health. Even though this is a bold claim, I think that he would succeed in abolishing segregation, at least in the states that fought on his side in 1861. Racism would thus evaporate in America several decades earlier, making America stronger and perhaps more active in the first half of the next century, but we are yet to get there. I realize that this may be very optimistic, but it's very possible, but not guaranteed, of course. As for King Carlos VI, he will probably also rule until the end of the 19th century. Anyways, since the Spanish and the Americans are now partners, it is almost impossible for a Spanish-American war to ever break out. Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines and northwestern Papua New Guinea will thus remain under the administration of the Spanish Empire, albeit this time with greater autonomy, due to which there will be no such large rebellions. The Spanish-American partnership will also bring the following fruits to both countries. The Panama Canal would be established a few years earlier during the reign of Theodore Roosevelt, which would also be this time re-elected in 1908 as well, leaving the United States far away from the ideology of isolationism. After the death of King Carlos VI, the new King of Spain becomes Carlos de Bourbon i Austria Esse, crowned Prince Carlos VII, who would be the one to support Roosevelt's plan to create the Panama Canal. Many conflicts in South America would also have been avoided, as Spain would control all of these countries that fought historically. For example, the deadliest conflict in South America, the War of the Triple Alliance, wouldn't happen in this timeline, due to Uruguay, Argentina and Paraguay being within the Spanish Commonwealth. This results in a more peaceful South America, increasing prosperity and the continent might realize its potential. A possible war between Spain and Brazil or Spain and Portugal is possible, but I cannot really predict that, so I will say that it doesn't happen. During his reign, Spain becomes as industrialized as neighboring France, which is already preparing for a potential war with the German Empire. After the death of Carlos VII in 1909, 
The new ruler of the Spanish Empire becomes the first liberal-oriented king named Jaime de Bourbon, crowned as Jaime III. Even in our history, Jaime III was a heavy supporter of the constitutional monarchy that the United Kingdom was then, and at the same time he was strongly pro-French. He even praised the French Republican regime insisting on freedom of religion. Thus, since 1910, Spain begins to befriend the Triple Entente. For the first time since the beginning of the last century, it begins to slowly liberalize and democratize. Since the Spanish still partially control most of Central and South America at the time, the Iberian Empire has one of the largest armies in Europe. Thanks to the United States, this army also has the most modern rifles and artillery. And now comes the best part, the First World War. Now that the Kingdom of Spain is an ally of the Entente, it is understandable that at the end of the summer of 1914, when Germany declares war on France, it will join this conflict. However, the war would not last four years, but only one or two, as the Spanish troops alongside the French and the British do not allow the Germans to drive the French beyond the Seine River. The Germans are thus focused to move parts of their troops from Prussia to Alsace-Lorraine, which results in a successful invasion of the Russians into the whole of Galicia, thereby threatening northern Hungary. At the end of autumn, Luxembourg and Belgium are liberated, while the Russians occupy East Prussia, including Dan's Corridor and the Poznan province. During that time, neighboring Austria-Hungary did not manage to conquer even parts of Serbia and Montenegro. Thanks to the successes of the Entente Army, the Ottoman Empire enters the war against Germany and Austria-Hungary. To understand this, the Ottoman Empire entered the Great War on the side of the Central Powers, because Britain refused to hand over the newly constructed cruisers they had originally built for the Ottoman fleet. To this day, the British justify it by saying that they needed those cruisers at sea against the German battleships. However, now that France is victorious on the mainland alongside its allies, there is no need to fear the German fleet, with the British handing over the newly built cruisers to the Ottomans, causing Sultan Mehmed V to declare war on the Central Powers as originally planned in our history. In my opinion, this is a genius move by the Antant Powers to secure an ally. As for what the Ottoman Empire would gain, I'm sure they would be allowed something in Arabia, maybe even British Bahrain, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Cyprus is also a possibility. After the entry of the Kingdom of Italy into the war at the beginning of 1915, both the Germans and the Austrians are being pushed inland. Bulgaria may even join this war on the side of the Entente too, if Russia promises them parts of Macedonia and in return Serbia would form Yugoslavia. This trade-off logically makes sense for Serbia, but the thing is that they might not accept. This is because Serbia has claimed that to them Macedonia is more important than Bosnia. For the sake of this scenario, let's say that the Antan forces them to agree to this. This way, the truce of the Ottoman Empire can cross into the Balkans and help Serbia out. Thus, the Serbs, supported by the Turks, liberate Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the Russians push the Germans beyond the Oda River, while the French push the Germans beyond the Rhine. In the summer of 1915, when the Italians successfully liberated all the Italian inhabited territories of Austria-Hungary, the representatives of the Central Powers signed the capitulation. Since America did not join the war, the nation's right to self-determination would not play such a significant role in the Treaty of Versailles. The Ottoman Empire receives Cyprus as a reward. Serbia acquires Bosnia and Herzegovina, which gives the Serbs access to the sea. Hungary becomes an independent kingdom, stretching from the Carpathian Mountains to the Adriatic Sea. The Kingdom of Croatia becomes a semi-autonomous country within the Hungarian crown. The Entente would fear that a strong Yugoslavia would upset the balance of power in the Balkans. Now, Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary and Romania are about the same strength and population. Italy acquires all the territories inhabited by the Italians, plus all of Slovenia, which, like Croatia, becomes a semi-autonomous region. From the remnants of the former Austria-Hungary, Austria-Bohemia emerges as a neutral monarchy, under the new emperor Charles I, who was one of the few Habsburgs known for his love of the Czech nation. All of Galicia is annexed into Tsarist Russia. Belgium gains German UPN, while France regains Alsace-Lorraine, which it lost in 1870. Most of German overseas colonies are acquired by Spain, with the exception of German Tanganyika, which is annexed by Great Britain and Belgium, and German Togoland, which is divided between France and the United Kingdom. Given that the Great War lasted only for about a year or two, it's impossible for the Bolsheviks to come to power in Russia and the ultranationalists to come to power in Italy. In addition, due to the fact that the United States never entered the war and the previously mentioned short-lived Great War, the Great Depression will probably never occur. At worst, it would not have such apocalyptic effects on the whole world thanks to a faster recovery of Europe. The United Kingdom becomes an imperial federation, whereby Ireland remains part of the Commonwealth, but as an autonomous kingdom with Irish Catholic establishment. Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and British Malaysia 
are granted maximum autonomy, while the British Raj within the Commonwealth transforms into the Indian Confederation, divided into Pakistan, Central India, South India, Bangladesh and eventually Burma. Similarly, the victorious France is also trying to adapt to this new era, which is starting to invest in industry and infrastructure in Africa and French into China. The Kingdom of Spain, which had been functioning as a commonwealth for hundreds of years, becomes a fully constitutional monarchy thanks to the more liberal rule of Jaime III. The Catholic Church is separated from the state at the end of the 1920s, but Christianity and the legacy of Jesus Christ continue to play an important moral and cultural role throughout the Spanish Commonwealth. As for the German Empire, after 1915, Kaiser Wilhelm II is forced to hand over his power to the people, thus abandoning the absolutist way of ruling. At the end of the year, the first democratic elections will take place, in which the Social Democrats win, which subsequently transformed the state into a constitutional monarchy. In neighboring Austria Bohemia, after the elections, Emperor Charles mandates the Austrian Christian Democrats and the Czech agrarians to form a new, more liberal government. Thanks to Austrian tourism and Czech industry, the new empire becomes a more stable new Euro country in the early 1920s. The Kingdom of Hungary remains in a personal union with Austria Bohemia, but the state itself is fully independent. In the years 1917-1918, there is a civil war in which Slovaks, Ruthenians, Romanians and Serbs try to either gain independence or join their neighboring country. Charles I, who does not want to provoke another war with his intervention, decides to ask the Antan states as they, the victors, can decide the fate of Hungary. Britain and France, who do not want any further Russian expansion to the west, decide to help the Hungarians. At the end of 1917 and 1918, volunteer divisions are sent from Italian-controlled Slovenia with the aim of restoring order in the Hungarian Carpathians. After defeating the rebels, the monarchy was abolished in 1919 and the Republic, headed by Mikolai Karoli, was proclaimed. Slovaks, Ruthenians, Romanians and Serbs are given partial autonomy, while Croatia is handed over to the Italians as a protectorate. This is not to make the Serbians stronger, ensuring Hungarian domination over these minorities. As for Russia, despite the victory, the country finds itself in a crisis. The annexation of Galicia, inhabited by Poles and Ukrainians, to the empire intensifies Polish and Ukrainian nationalism. Nikolas II, who gained new self-confidence, began to liquidate these new separatist movements by force. After his death in the late 1920s, his democracy-oriented son, Alexei Nikolaevich, tries to federalize and liberalize the country. Thus, Russia is de facto in a situation like Spain at the beginning of the 19th century. Finns, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Moldavians, the Caucasian nations are given autonomy, slowly turning Russia into a commonwealth among the lines of Britain and Spain. As for any future conflicts, I have no idea. Germany wasn't punished too badly, and the Kaiser would be still in charge, just within a constitutional monarchy, but with a stable government. The rise of the Austrian painter is for sure not going to happen, and with Italy even gaining Croatia as a protectorate, the Italian Duce won't come to power. This is maybe a more peaceful world, but there is no doubt that if there was a war to break out, it would be perhaps more deadly than the Second World War. This is because all of these countries have population over 100 million, including their colonies. If a war were to include any of these states, millions would die. In a previous video, I introduced the concept of the alternate history realism meter, so please the realism of this video from 1 to 10. I also want you to check out this old video I made regarding Spain winning the war against the United States in 1898. Hope to see you there.